<laughs> certainly not making any money out of that profession. <laughs> However, I had entered the clothing business. Designer label clothing. And the title will come up, I believe, there. Uh, talking to people about being clothed with Christ. Uh, so that is the subject of this morning's message. I don't want to make any money out of that either. But if someone can be clothed or put on Christ, that would be wonderful. Mm. Let's just open in a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this chance to share from your word. We want to speak more about the Lord Jesus and the importance of him in our lives. So just touch our hearts, we pray. In his name, amen. In looking at clothing, my first thought for some reason went to, what does God wear? This one does. Well, the Bible tells me, Psalm 93, 1, he is clothed with majesty and strength. 103, 1, you are clothed with honour and majesty. You are covered, covering yourself with light as with a garment. <coughs> Clothing can be a picture or example of a person. And that was an example of God and his character. Psalm 109, 18, on the lesser note, speaks of a man who was clothed with cursing as a garment. Now that's something you wouldn't want, isn't it? I trust you wouldn't anyway. Mm. But that is the characteristic of that person. <clears throat> Clothes maketh a man was the old idiom or parable. Mm. Proverb rather. But it's not necessarily true, you know, because God knows the thoughts and intents of every man's heart. Nothing can be hidden from him. Christ's heavenly clothing in the transfiguration scene of Christ in the Gospels. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. It's taken from the two examples. Saul of Tarsus saw Jesus like that, and he was blind for three days until he was healed. Christ's earthly clothing would have been similar in style to that of the other Jewish men round about him. Some see some meeting in the seamless garment. But Christ himself criticised the scribes of his day for their long robes and wanting the first place in the synagogue and other things. Priestly robes under the old covenant had tremendous meaning. The colours and the way they were made pointed to the great high priest who was to come, Jesus Christ. Why they are worn, priestly robes are worn today, I have no idea. I googled it and couldn't find anything. I know of no reason. But the first clothes were worn in the Garden of Eden, and Michael, you'll probably be pleased to hear that. You, you like priestly robes, do you? <laughs> you wore a tie once, that's getting there. First clothing, Adam and Eve in the garden. As soon as sin entered the world, they were ashamed. And God clothed them with animal skins. Doesn't exactly say so, but the shedding of an animal's blood points to the cross of Calvary where Christ shed his blood, as we've been reminded this morning, so that we can be forgiven our sins. This morning I want to speak about putting on and putting off. And it comes from Romans 13, 10 to 14. Thank you, Linda. It's very colourful. Two words, key words there, put on and put off. <coughs> In the Greek they are different words. Put off is a word that means to cast off, a very strong negative word, to get rid of. But to put on, especially in put on Christ, means to clothe yourself with him. The NIV trans translates it that way. Put on Christ like a garment. Immerse yourself into a garment. Do you have a favourite garment at home? Something which you can just immerse yourself in and immediately feel mm. surrounded, comforted, loved maybe, comfortable. That's what it's like to be clothed with Christ. I want to read from Romans chapter 13, 10 to 14. 
And a lot of this in the Greek, if you fancy knowledge of Greek, it's in the aorist tense, and that is it was accomplished in the past, continues into today, and will continue into the future. Romans 13, 10 to 14 says, and there's two put-ons here, Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We need to wake out of our sleep. The time is short. We need to tell others about Jesus. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Salvation is threefold. When we first came to Christ, we received the absolute guarantee of heaven. Then there is the salvation from sin as we go through life. And ultimately the redemption of the body is when we are caught up to be with the Lord in the heaven and we'll have a body like unto his glorious body. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. There's a put off. And let us put on the armour of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness. Not in lewdness and lust. Not in strife and envy. Well, it doesn't have to be dark these days for that sort of thing in the world around us, does it? It happens 24 hours. But we, as Christians, are of those who are of the day in the light. Like in Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, speaks about that after just talking about the catching up of the saints into heaven. It says, But put on, or be clothed with the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfil its lusts. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ as sinking into a garment. John's Gospel, chapter 1, tells us about the light. And as we put Christ on, we put on the armour of light. But I want to read from Philippians 2.15, which says, That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault. Remember Job, who was blameless and upright in all his ways, but ended up saying, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So I'll do that again. That you may be blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And you can also see Matthew 5, 14 to 16, Ephesians 5, 8, and 11 to 17. Blameless. Would that be something that would characterise me without fault? <coughs> Should have left Norman behind today, shouldn't I? I might have been able to convince someone. <laughs> <laughs> but I've got no hope. Let us turn then to Linda, please. Colossians 3. There's 17 verses here to read, so time will no doubt run out shortly. And there are many active words in this section. Seek, set, put, put off, do not, put on, bearing with, put on again. Let the peace, let the word, and do all action words or active words, things we are to be actively doing in our lives and continuously doing as we go through on our Christian pathway. Two key words, put off and put on again. Put off to the best holy, to strip or cast off, clothes or arms. And we'll see some of these things aren't nice. There's many other things that aren't mentioned here. But wouldn't it be much better if we didn't enter into these things beforehand rather than having to put them off? And then there's those things that we are to put on. The things that are to characterise us as believers. Colossians 3, if then you are raised of Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's the Christian pathway, as it should be, with wearing clothed with Christ, and there's a hint of baptism there that comes through more and more as I've been looking at this. If you are raised with Christ, 
for you died. As we have gone down into the waters of baptism, we'll look at it more late, late, later. It's symbolic of dying to that old sinful way of life. This way of life that we need to put off. And coming out of the waters of baptism to walk in newness of life. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. We are to put them to death, be done with them, have nothing to do with them anymore. But now you yourselves are to put off, and keep putting off, I added there, all these and many more. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. And John mentioned that last week. In fact, I think John spoke about it on Colossians 3 not that long ago. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man of his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. I remember as a boy in a Bible study once, I was asked who the old man was, and I replied, my father. <laughs> and I was no longer favourite son, number one. Put off the old man, that old sinful nature, and put on the new man, that of the Lord Jesus Christ. Goes on to say, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, or any other group of people in the world today, and those wonderful words, but Christ is all and in all. I trust Christ is all, but especially is all in all to each of us <coughs> this morning. Then it goes on to the character of that new man as in Christ. And I trust this is what we demonstrate day by day as we go about life. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. It's very definite, isn't it? It's easy to forgive someone when they come up and say, I've truly repented of the wrong I did to you. But can we forgive people when they don't even recognise they've done wrong? I found out the peace it gives in life when you forgive someone, even though they've done terrible things against you and they, they're not remotely sorry for it. But to have an attitude of forgiveness gives peace in your own heart. <clears throat> but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are called in one body, and be thankful. It's much better to be thankful than to be complaining and unthankful, even though we go through trials and tribulations in life. In everything give thanks. It's much easier to say from here than it is to put into practice sometimes, but even in the difficulties of life, we can be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing of grace in your hearts to the Lord. Hasn't been worshipping here this morning. That's what we've been doing. You associate wisdom, teaching and admonishing with the pastor. He does all that type of stuff, doesn't he? Or the preacher or the elders. And yet even though the worship is ascending into heaven's realm this morning. That is the directional flow. There is inevitably that flow sideways as it edifies our hearts, fills our hearts with wonder, and yet sometimes challenges our hearts too, as the words of the hymn. All to Jesus I surrender, all to thee I freely give, we often sing. That's admonishing ourselves. It's not having a go at each other at all, but admonishment can actually mean mild, from mild rebuke 
to encouragement. And finally, and whatever you do in word of thee, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. How can we do this? The conversion at this point of time when we truly put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing he shed blood for a remission of sins, the Lord Jesus dwells in our hearts through faith. We are fully clothed with Christ right there and right then. We are justified, pronounced not guilty by the judge himself. We have the guarantee of heaven. We are baptised of the Holy Spirit. We're a newborn. We're baptised by one spirit into one body. We're sealed of the Holy Spirit in the day of redemption and on and on and on. All those wonderful things that we have received through Christ. But then there is a continuation. I was sanctified then, I was made holy, but the process of sanctification is to continue throughout our lifetime. Galatians 3, 26 and 7 says, For ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptised into Christ have put on Christ, or been clothed with Christ. And in chapter 2, 20, says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 4.19, my little children for whom I labour in birth again until Christ is formed in you. You see, being clothed in Christ is not just some outer garment that's casually wrapped around. It so much permeates us that it is to permeate our heart. And that's Christ being formed in the hearts of believers. Our lifestyle, live your life in the same manner as the Lord lived while on earth. Display the same qualities or attributes that Jesus displayed. Love for all, servant attitude, truthfulness, humility, mercy, forgiveness, and goes on and on. Live in a righteous way. In 2 Corinthians 6, 7, we are told that by the word of truth, by the power of God, and by the armour of righteousness on the right hand and the left. Remember the armour of light, we've also got the armour of righteousness. And Ephesians 6.11 comes to mind. Put on the whole armour of God to help us to go through this life, putting on Christ and putting off anything that would hinder. And finally, vitally important, identify and keep company with God's people and other believers. Can we put Paul's seven wishes up, please, and just briefly? These are four wishes expressed by the Apostle Paul in the Bible, and every single one has to do with Jesus Christ. That I may know him, that I may win Christ, to magnify Christ, to be found in Christ, to be conformed to Christ, to be with Christ, to rejoice in the day of Christ. That last one is when Christ returns to take his saints up to be with him in heaven. It might sound strange that he would say that I may win Christ because he already was Christ. But it is in that same aorist tense that it is to continue on and on, ever increasing more about Jesus day by day. Thank you, Linda. Finally, I'd just like to have a quick look at Isaiah 61. There's two lines there that I love. It says, I will great, this is Isaiah 61, 10 to 11, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. There is a Jewish context to that which I won't go into this morning, but it required the death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. For he has clothed me. An accomplished fact, Jesus has clothed me with the garments of salvation. I trust we can all say that this morning. Jesus has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Praise God for that.
Revelation 19, 7 to 8 is another scene. Seen in heaven the marriage supper of the Lamb. It says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it had been granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. John MacArthur, a preacher in America, summed this message up this way. He said, you can't crash into the kingdom without the proper robe. You can't get in unless you have the garment. And what's the garment? You know what the garment is, it's what? It's righteousness, and that's Isaiah 61.10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And so when you come to Christ, you put on Christ in the sense that you put on his righteousness. You put on his holiness. You put on his nature. And God sees you as righteous in Jesus Christ. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And you will notice, won't you, from the parable on, even through the Pauline epistles, this imagery of putting on a garment is emblematic of putting on the righteousness of Christ. So when you became a believer, you did that. And the best word to use is in a positional sense. Positionally, I am righteous. Positionally, I'm perfect. Not practically. You did that before God, and God sees you in Christ, where you receive them as a cleared or imputed righteousness. But that brings us to the second dimension. Putting on Jesus Christ also is an exaltation given to believers. How can you say to a believer who has already put on Christ to put on Christ? Very simply, what he is saying is that this has happened to you positionally. But let it happen to you practically. I used to think of it in terms of an athlete, John MacArthur said, who puts on the uniform of a great team. It's one thing to wear the uniform and be on the team. It's something else to play up to the reputation of the team. So let us act like it, he said. There is a word to one chorus as I close. We used to sing it. It says, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus. All I ask to be like him. All through life's journey from earth to glory. All I ask to be like him. To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. All I ask to be like him. Not in a measure, but in its fullness. All I ask to be like him. May we be diligent to put off, cast away everything that would hinder us in our relationship and walk with Jesus and find ourselves clothed, immersed in that glorious garment of Christ and let our light shine out into the sin-darkened world around us so that others might know what it is to have Christ as our all in all. Father, we just thank you and praise you for what you have done for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. We give you thanks and we do pray earnestly for Carmen and the family again at this time that their comfort might be found in the Lord Jesus. We thank you that Roger knew and loved him and that he is now in heaven of his Saviour. Just encourage and bless that household, we pray, and others who have been through sin. Help us to talk to others about Jesus this week and tell them of his love. We ask it in Jesus' worthy and precious name. Amen.